Well, so there is a great need to reduce the suffering of all creatures, humans and non-humans alike. There are many times when we suffer either from obvious physical pain because we have, we've burned, we've been shot, we've been, you know, obviously directly physical injured that you can get in humans and in animals or because you, you suffer, you're depressed, your mate has died, your child has died, you've lost a leg and now, you know, you realize there are certain things that are forever, you're not, you know, you're never able to run anymore. Uh, and so the question is, how can some of this research lead to the amelioration or the elimination or the reduction of uh, of subjective experience pain. Yes, so obviously for a very practical reason that's in a very important subject. In some cases we know and then we can simply not do a lot about it at this point. At, at least science. Now you can try to do so, you know, I just spent I, two months ago I was in India meeting a week with His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, and you know they practice these techniques of mindfulness, which you can also find in, in Western tradition. I was just rereading, I don't know if you know it, the emperor, the Roman emperor Marcus Aurelius, written this wonderful book, Confession. Um, meditation, where he meditates, so this was the emperor Marcus Aurelius, second century after Christ, where essentially he talks about mindfulness in a, in a purely Roman, you know, just where he makes this argument, accept what you don't control and the only thing you control is the way you respond to events, including pain. Now, this was 2000 years ago when people had vastly more pain. And so this is something I can apply in my life and also your mom. The only thing you control, and her mom sees now directly, I don't control external people. I don't control event only to a very limited extent, but the only thing I can control is how I respond to these events. And that's essentially mindfulness in a, in a, in a Roman uh, tradition. So the only thing I can control when I'm in pain, how do I respond to the pain? You know, ultimately the best way of dealing is just accepting it. Okay, now I'm, now this is pain. And I know it's going to have some time cause and tomorrow morning it's going to go away and tomorrow evening it'll come back. And that's just the way it is. It's just like, okay, now I see, I see myself angry. So now I can sort of look down on me. Okay, here's Christoph being angry and here's Christoph being sad. And, and just accept it and then it'll, what you see, it, it has less and less influence on you because, the, you know, the, it, it doesn't influence you, it doesn't modulate you as much as if you're sort of trying to fight it all the time. That's what mindful techniques teach us, whether in the, Christ, in the Western tradition or in the Eastern Buddhist tradition. Hmm. You mentioned that it would be good if we had a watertight scientific sort of understanding of it. Um, because we had to make specific predictions about what would, what sort of mind states would be suffering, what wouldn't. Are we at the moment ready to sort of research into sort of uh, these in information, integrated information, theoretical view on on suffering and pleasure? Are we ready for that yet? Do you think we could start getting involved in a project to do this? Well, there's, we can certainly do mindfulness. We can certainly do all these meditative techniques at a practical level. If you want to help people like your mom, you don't need to know the details of the neural correlates and whether IT is, how IT relates to it. If the technique works, it can help you and your mom, period. End of story. Now, scientifically, the question, how do, if it works, how does it work? What are the mechanisms? Are they easy to entrain? Can I facilitate this? Or does this require 20 years of, you know, eight hours a day daily meditation practice? Because then it's not going to be very useful for most people. Can I make it more efficient? Can I make it, you know, faster, etc.? Those are techniques. Those are questions that people are studying right now. Yes. So in principle, this, this can be studied. And people are, are doing not pl um, pain and pleasure necessarily, they're looking at color and the perception of sounds and tones. In fact, right here at Monash University, people are doing this, these sorts of studies with respect to IIT. Okay, cool. What about in the future? I mean, like animals don't know to meditate and sort of be mindful. However, there's an awful lot of suffering in some of the, the, the animal, especially the farmed animals, we, we assume. People aren't convinced necessarily that it's bad to treat pigs badly because 
right? People might argue that we can't because we can't measure this. So how do I how do I assume the babies suffer? <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I can't I can't way. ask them, right? So I make assumption. I look at their blood pressure. I look at their stress hormones. I look at how often they cry. And I can do the same thing in a monkey. I can do the same thing in a pig. And I see the response is very, very similar to that of a baby or some other human who's unable to talk. We are all nature's children. We're very closely related. I think it's, this is something particularly in the West we have. We have this belief in human exceptionalism that somehow we are exceptional. We are special. Only we suffer. And all the animals, they're just mere machines. I think, I mean, it couldn't be more wrong. We are, we, are, we are all together on this. Animals can, of course, suffer. What they don't have, they don't have. So when you see, for example, a dog that's been hit and run, and now, you know, it's, uh, the, the, um, you know now let's see, he has one of these little carriages, you know, or you have a three-legged dog, the dog looks as happy as he could be because he doesn't realize, because he doesn't have a lot of self-consciousness. That, that's a big difference between us and most animals. I know I'm going to die one day. I can project myself in the future. So I know if I have lost an arm or leg, as I said, I cannot run, I can't do a marathon anymore, you know, there are many things I can't do anymore. The dog doesn't, doesn't have that. The dog is conscious, but the dog is just here in the present. So the dog cannot, can, doesn't realize that, okay, I can never run as fast now than as, as if I had. He can't go through these counterfactually. He doesn't have the co cognitive capability. So in that sense, he doesn't have that sort of suffering. But he can certainly be abused. He can be very sad because he's lost his mate or he's lost his human companion. There's no question about that in animals. So, so we need to treat him with, with, uh, with compassion. So, for example, for me, one of the consequences, 14 years ago, I stopped eating meat. So I'm not eating the flesh of mammals or birds anymore. Very good. Do you, you want to talk more about that? Because that's interesting to me. Like, uh... Well, so the, the story is, this happened 14 years. So I always had a bad, I like meat. Okay. And like most of us, I, you know, I grew up in a meat eating family. I always ate meat and I liked it. Uh, but I always, as I study more and more consciousness, particularly in animals, I felt queasy about it because I realized this is probably not right. And when you look at some of the videos, you know, the way animals are treated in, on farm animals, really horrible. It's really atrocious how a Christian nation like my nation, America, can claim to be really tr uh, Christian and treat animals in that horrible way. I don't understand. But I was too attached to it. And then one night, my beloved, beloved black germ shepherd, Nosy. So I had this 14 year old, uh, for 14 years, this, um, our family dog, a black germ shepherd, Nosy, and she died in my arms. And so as I was, you know, it was very distraught, was crying, she was in my arms dying. And I thought, how can I be so distraught here? But but eat with pleasure the, uh, the meat, the flesh of an animal like pig, or, you know, that, that is not that dissimilar. Its brain is roughly the size of a dog. It's, very, it, it's quite intelligent, can do all sorts of things. So this doesn't seem right. This doesn't seem right. And so I, that night I decided, partly to honor no, Nosy, and partly because it was the right thing to do, I would never eat flesh again. Hmm. Yes, I had a similar experience, not, not because of a pet dying, but just thinking about the, the awful nature of the, the, the factory farming. And, you know, like, especially when it comes to chickens and pigs. I mean, cows, yes, but they usually get to walk around in the field and it's not as bad as, like, the way pigs are confined, at least as far as I understand. So I'm, I'm totally with you there. Um, and, in fact, David Pierce, I'm not sure if you know of <laughs> David Pierce. Um, he wrote the hedonistic imperative. His his I, I read a lot of his writing, and he kind of like influenced me in that direction. So that's awesome. <laughs> well, no, I've heard about the book, the hedonistic imperative. Yeah, so it's it's different if you have an animal that lives, let's say, you know, an elk or something that lives for two years in the forest, and then somebody shoots it. That's one thing. But I mean, yeah, those farmed animals is that's really bad. It's really bad. And it's some don't, you know, today we look back and say, how could people, smart people like the Greek uh, philosophers or, you know, our foundation, our, our you know, in America, the, the presidents, Washington, etc. How could they have, how, how, how could they have 
had slaves. How could they live with themselves? And of course, you know, everybody else did it. There were justifications for it. It may well be that in 200 years or 500 years from now, we say, well, how could those enlightened people in the 21st century have kept all those animals under those atrocious conditions? How could they have lived with themselves? And today, if you say that, well, most people just roll their eyes. Hmm. It is sort of socially accepted and therefore... Totally accepted. Because it's yeah, it's 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 thought of as like just one of the, one of the things that we just don't think about. You know, nobody likes to see the inside of an abattoir or, or a factory farm before they have dinner. No, that's the reason why. Yeah. Um, okay. So, yeah, David Pierce's work. He also um, wrote the abolitionist project, which is very focused around what you just said. Then, <coughs> that, that exact argument, except in long form. Uh, so, yeah. Well, and then, of course, you have uh, Peter Singer, another Australian, right? I've interviewed him, too. I'm going to be meeting him on Friday. He's here now? Oh, yeah. You should, there's a humanist conference that I'm participating in. Um, Peter Singer's had some wonderful arguments. Yeah, if it's a, yeah I'd, I'd fully buy into his... Yeah. yeah. Well, but you see, now, I, I buy into his argument, but, of course, also, so I, I'm the director or president of a lab that uses a lot of mice to study their brain. Now, how can I justify that? So, um, moral rights is always about relative, tra it's all about trade-offs, like, you know, don't kill, but then there's abortion, don't kill, but then there's a war, right? Don't kill, but then, you know, there's this horrible person who's in chronic pain, right? So we, it's all about these, these trade-offs. So, yes, we shouldn't, in principle, every living thing, conscious living thing, should be free to live as they want. On the other hand, in order to really fully eliminate a lot of suffering, like diseases, one of my daughters died of sudden infant death syndrome. My dad died of Parkinson compounded by, late, by, by Alzheimer. Okay, that's all terrible suffering that that occurred in themselves and then in my, my family, etc. So I don't want, I want to prevent this and that requires experimentation done with compassion so you have to treat those animals the mice not like they're just chemicals they're conscious being and so you need to minimize their discomfort and suffering whenever possible but but you know you you we we have to use them to understand ourselves because their brain is so similar to our brains we can use them to develop therapies to then ultimately reduce the suffering of all creatures so it's a you know it's a it's a subtle argument but the world is a subtle place what did Buddha say? Let all who have life be delivered from suffering. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah I, I buy into that argument too. Uh, I think it's unfortunate, but we're still at a stage where we cannot make real significant scientific progress without making tests on biology. So That's correct. All things considered, as a consequentialist, I think that it's good to do the experiments. Yes, and I think consequentialism is the right attitude there. Mm.